speaker, which is a uh, Florian Traman, uh, Trammer. He's a PhD student at Stanford University, advised by Dan Bonnet. His research line to the intersection of computer science, cryptography, machine learning, and security, and, and his focus on the topic of the worst case behavior for deep learning systems and how we can mitigate these uh, long-term threats to safety and privacy for users. So thank you very much, Florian, for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, let's see, there we go. Okay. Yeah, so thanks everyone for being here um, and thanks for inviting me. So the topic for my talk of today will be a little different from media forensics as uh, we'll be talking about adversarial machine learning um, in the context of facial recognition, which is sort of a slightly different topic you can see some of the deep fakes that we've been hearing about so far. Uh, but I actually think that some of the lessons that we learned about adversarial machine learning, about threat modeling and so on in this project, uh, that these lessons are actually broadly applicable to some of the work in this community as well. And so I hope that you'll find this interesting. There we go. So about two years ago, a company called clearview.ai made for some quite scary news headlines was what this company did is that they compiled a huge data set of people's faces by just scraping the web. And they then built a large scale facial recognition model that can presumably recognize all of us. And they then went and sold this tool to law enforcement agencies in the US. And they were probably not the first to do this. There's been talk about facial recognition being used for mass surveillance for a while now, and advances in computer vision are just continuously making these tools better and better. And making it worse, these privacy invasive tools are no longer just in the hands of the police. Uh, so there are now some services out there, such as PimEyes, uh, that anyone can use to recognize someone in a picture. So I actually tried this tool um, a few days ago, and it's actually scary, scarily good. Like I give it a picture a selfie of myself and just find sort of every public picture of myself that's available online. And so this really isn't great for our privacy. And it would be really cool if there were a way of protecting ourselves from these kind of tools that really invade on our online privacy. And luckily a solution to this has been proposed. Uh, so about two years ago, some researchers from the University of Chicago introduced uh, Fox, which is a system that lets users perturb the pictures that they post online so that uh, the machine learning models that are used in facial recognition systems, like in clearview.ai, will fail to user. And this got a lot of publicity, including from the New York Times, and their tool actually has now been downloaded over 500,000 times. So this really reached uh, a lot of people. A lot of people are very excited about this prospect of being protected from facial recognition systems. And this has also prompted a lot of follow-up work with similar ideas, even in academia. There's this recent uh, low-key paper from the University of Maryland and the US Naval Academy that sort of proposes a very similar idea and gets better results than the original Fox system with a stronger attack. Um, there's been other follow-up academic work and even from industry, there's this chatbot firm that's presumably doing something similar uh, to, to your pictures. And so unfortunately we argue that these tools are not going to save you from facial recognition. This is going to be true. And in fact, uh, we even claim that these tools might harm user privacy more than they really protect them in that they actually provide users with a very compelling but ultimately false sense of security. And so what we show is that these attacks, first of all, are very brittle. All it really takes to defeat them is for the facial recognition system to use a slightly better model than the one that's used by the users in their attack. And moreover, if the facial recognition system sort of explicitly tries to harden their model against the attack, then the attack just fails entirely. And to sort of make things worse, users will typically have no idea that this attack failed um, because systems such as clearview.ai aren't accessible to the public. You can never really tell if your attack worked until maybe the police shows up at your door because you participated in some protest against the government and uh, you're 
And so these systems that um, promised a lot to users and got sort of a lot of, of publicity because of this, um, that's why I claim they could end up doing more harm than good because they might convince some privacy concerned users of ultimately uploading pictures of themselves online with the sort of false belief that just by perturbing these pictures, um, they'll somehow end up being protected. So what are we gonna talk about today? First, I'm going to describe in a bit more detail how these attacks on facial recognition systems aim to work. And then I'll argue in more detail that the motivation for these attacks stems from some important misconceptions about uh, a class of attacks on machine learning models that are called adversarial examples. So we'll talk about adversarial examples and sort of in which situation adversarial examples work and which situations they might not. And so why we believe that in this particular context, this is really not the right tool and this is just not gonna work as an attack. And finally, I'll discuss some alternative solutions that might exist to protect ourselves from facial recognition. Um, spoiler alert, things don't really look good here. So I don't think we really have a particularly good way of, of protecting ourselves from these kind of tools. And this is maybe something we'll have to learn to live with in our future society, the same way we might have to learn with uh, learn how to deal with things like deep fakes. So let's first talk about attacking a facial recognition system. So I'll first describe in a bit more detail how a large scale facial recognition system works today. So these systems use neural networks to extract features from faces. So typically these feature extractors are just trained on huge curated data sets of faces that you can just sort of find online. And then given such a trained feature extractor, you build a facial recognition system using a quite simple nearest neighbor classifier. So you take all the images that you scraped from the web, extract feature vectors from each of these images and store these in a, in a large database. And then uh, when you want to identify someone new that you've taken a picture of, you also extract features from that uh, picture, and then you just search for the closest match in the database. And then uh, presumably you know the people who you've scraped the data from, you know their identities because you scrape the data, say from their personal web page or from a web page that also contained their name. And so then at test time, you just find the nearest neighbor um, and look for a match. Okay, so how could we go about attacking such a system? So attacks such as this Fox system or the Loki system, um, they critically rely on adversarial examples in machine learning. So even though machine learning models are getting extremely good at tasks like facial recognition, it turns out that you can just add a small amount of very carefully crafted noise to a picture like here on the left. And the model, so here the feature extractor, will just not be able to tell that these two pictures are actually of the same person. So this perturbation, even though it's very small and like, I mean, here it's sort of enlarged, this, this perturbation could be small to the point that it would be imperceptible to our own um, human vision. And yet for the neural network, these two pictures are like completely different somehow. So how can we abuse this to attack a system, uh, a facial recognition system? So what tools like Fox and Loki aim to do is that they use adversarial examples for what's called a poisoning attack. So here, what the user does is that they perturb all the pictures that they're gonna post online so that these pictures become adversarial examples. So every time you're gonna go say, upload the picture of yourself to Facebook, you're first gonna pass this through the Fox tool and this is gonna perturb the picture and then you post this perturbed picture online. And since the perturbation is very small, uh, your friends will still be able to enjoy these pictures and sort of see you enjoying your barbecue in the summer or something. But to a machine learning model, these pictures will sort of look nothing like the original person. Um, and so then if someone actually collects, scrapes all these pictures and builds a machine learning model uh, using these adversarial examples, the hope then is that if later on someone takes a picture of you um, say in the street at the protest or something, and this picture is gonna be unperturbed, the machine learning model is not gonna be able to tell that this is actually the same person that uploaded a perturbed picture early on. So it's very important here that the, the picture that ultimately gets fed into the facial recognition system is unperturbed here. This is sort of assumed that this is a picture that gets taken of you that you do not have control over. 
we need to protect ourselves in this setting. So poisoning a facial recognition system uh, with adversarial examples is actually very easy to do if you, uh, as a user, as an attacker, sort of know which model, which feature extractor is going to be used for facial recognition. Um, so here, all you have to do is what's called basically a white box attack. So you have access to this neural network, and you just need to find some perturbation of your image that causes this feature extractor to extract very, very different features. So um, this is sort of going to map your image to a completely different area in feature space. And then later on, um, when a unperturbed picture of you gets fed into the system, this is going to sort of map to the original place in feature space where your face should belong. And there's just no match is going to be found because this there, there's no picture in the database that matches these features. Now, of course, assuming that the user knows the feature extractor that's being used for facial recognition is quite unlikely because sort of opaque systems like clearview.ai, for these, we don't really know what kind of model they use and uh, we can't even interact with this model in any way. And so here, what systems such as Fox and Loki do is they rely on another surprising property of adversarial examples, namely that they transfer between models. And what this means is that a user can find a perturbation that misleads some feature extractor that they know, and then hope that this same perturbation will also work against uh, the unknown feature extractor that is used to, be, to build the facial recognition system. Okay, so that's sort of the general overview of how these attacks are supposed to work. Uh, so far, this seems quite reasonable. Uh, adversarial examples are a super challenging problem in machine learning, and it's widely believed that we won't solve this problem for quite a while. I argue that despite this, these poisoning attacks are doomed to fail because of some fundamental misconceptions about what adversarial examples can and actually can't do. And so the main misconception here is essentially an inversion of universal quantifiers. I'd like to give credit to Nicholas Carlini for this nice formulation of this misconception. Um, so what we know from adversarial examples um, is the following. For any model, we've been able to find adversarial examples for it. So more formally, for all models, there exists an attack. In the poisoning setting, we're actually asking for something much stronger. We want to find one attack that will transfer to sort of any model that might end up being used for facial recognition, even models we don't know about. And we have very good reasons to believe that this is not possible. And so let's look at how fair against uh, a variety of models that could be used for facial recognition. So we'll first look at the Fox system. And when Fox was released last year, it originally used a fairly weak attack that didn't work particularly well, even if the attacker knows the feature extractor that's being used. So if the user would have uploaded pictures protected by the original version of Fox, in about 55% of cases, uh, the, the model that then gets trained still recognizes them in an unperturbed picture. So the attack here isn't that effective to begin with. Um, and it turns out that if the facial recognition system moves to a newer um, feature extractor, a sort of a better feature extractor, then the attack fails entirely. Okay. And so the Fox designers realized this. And so they updated the system earlier this year to use a stronger attack. And this attack works very well against the known extractor. And it also transfers quite well to older extractors um, that use sort of similar, similar approaches. But it again completely fails against a newer state of the art extractor. This MacFace model, this was open source just a few months ago and sort of performs much better. And the attack sort of completely fails in this setting. Loki does a little better as it's a, it's a much newer attack. And so it directly targets today's best models and it transfers extremely well to this MacFace model. Um, and this isn't too surprising because Loki's internal attack uses a surrogate model that is very, very similar to MacFace. And so what if we look at a very different uh, type of model? So here we find that Loki actually transfers only moderately to OpenAI's recent clip model. 
so this clip model wasn't designed pretty good at extracting facial features. Um, and this model kind of learns presumably features that are quite different from traditional facial recognition models. Um, and so we see that this hurts transferability. So, um, and who knows how well this attack will, will fare against sort of better models even that will be found in a few years. And so it really seems that to defeat this kind of transfer attack, you just have to sort of on the defender side, on the facial recognition system side, you just have to switch to a slightly better model. And things are even worse if the trainer of the facial recognition system has access to the attack that the users use. And this is true for systems like Fox or Loki because these are publicly accessible. They want a sort of large user base. And so the model trainer can perturb some of their own pictures. And then they can use these to train a robust feature extractor. So what this means is that they'll train a model to extract similar features of the same person. And then, um, well, when uh, this feature extractor is then being used uh, on someone's pictures, the feature extractor will have learned to sort of resist the attack. And we find that this strategy is super effective. So if you use a robust feature extractor for facial recognition, the protection of both Fox and Loki becomes essentially null. Okay, so we've kind of shown that it's very easy to break these attacks and sort of make them ineffective. And now people who are familiar with uh, the literature on adversarial examples here, you, you might say, well, all I've really shown here is a defense against one particular attack. It's sort of shown that if you take the attack that's currently used by the Fox or Loki system, it's very easy to sort of defeat this attack. Um, but this robust feature extractor here, it's not robust against otherwise solved adversarial examples. And we definitely don't claim to have done that. And so maybe all the user has to do is sort of switch to a better attack, sort of use an adaptive attack that targets a robust feature extractor. Um, and so you might then wonder, well, aren't we just sort of entering a standard arms race here where attackers will consistently deploy stronger attacks in response to better defenses that might get deployed? And this arms race actually seems to have already started. So as I mentioned earlier, Fox uh, recently updated its attack a few months ago. And the reason was actually that the authors of Fox noticed that their attack had stopped being effective against a new feature extractor that was deployed in Microsoft Azure. And it's likely that they would change the attack again uh, in the near future so that the attack would also work against the Mac face model where we found it wasn't effective. And this brings us to our second sort of core misconception about adversarial examples and about adversarial machine learning more broadly uh, in this context, which is that there cannot always be an arms race. And facial recognition is actually a prime example of a situation where I claim that the attacker is poised to lose in the long run. And this sort of is very, very different from the standard setting in which we consider adversarial examples for evasion attacks where the attacker sort of always has the upper hand. So why do I claim that this is not going to be an arms race? But the main reason is simply that the attacker kind of has to commit to, the, to their attack um, first. And so once a picture is perturbed and posted online and it gets scraped by a facial recognition system, the attack that was used on this picture cannot be changed anymore. You cannot sort of go back and sort of take your picture back from the web scraper and sort of change the perturbation. Um, and so what the facial recognition system can do is just scrape people's pictures continuously and just store these in a big database. And then at some point in the future, where say a better model will have appeared, the facial recognition system can just apply these newer and better models retroactively to pictures that were scraped in the past. And these pictures that were used in the past sort of used a weak attack. And so now, even if the users switch to a much stronger attack and sort of start using a stronger attack for new pictures that they upload online, well, this is useless because the facial recognition system can just ignore sort of any picture maybe that was uploaded in the past six months um, and just wait until an even better model comes out, say in a year from now, and then again, apply it retroactively to people's pictures. And so taking a step back, the, the bigger issue at play here 
is actually that it's biometric privacy that doesn't admit an arms race. What I mean by this is that our biometric features, such as our facial features, they change very little over time. Uh, so for example, when I feed a picture of myself from today to PimEyes, it just finds pictures of me that are like six years old. Uh, and it would probably find even older pictures. It just turns out that I think the oldest public picture of me that's online is from like six years ago. Um, and yeah, I mean, our faces don't change much over time. And so a facial recognition system that was trained on these pictures from six years ago can very easily recognize me today. And what this means is that if we ever lose our biometric privacy, if sort of someone ever manages to kind of train a machine learning model that recognizes my facial features, I have no hope of regaining my privacy. I can't just go and change my face and sort of start over. And so poisoning attacks for facial recognition face an impossibly high bar in that they have to succeed against every single model that's going to be deployed for many, many years into the future. And these models that are going to be deployed in a few years from now, they might be using new techniques that haven't been discovered yet. So we have no hope of sort of adapting our tack to these techniques that haven't even been discovered yet. Or these models used in, in a few years in the future, they might sort of have been made much more robust. And so we have sort of no hope that the attacks that we're going to deploy today are still going to work um, in a few years from now. OK, so is there then any hope that we can defeat these large scale facial recognition systems? So well, maybe we just have to stop posting pictures online. Um, and well, that's definitely one way we could make sure that these systems uh, don't work. Um, but this isn't actually that easy to do. So there's a bunch of pictures of myself online that I didn't upload. Um, actually, I think the majority of pictures, public pictures of myself that I find when, when doing a Google search, these were pictures that someone took at like some, some event at the conference or something and just posted online. So I, I never would have even gotten the choice to upload them or, or perturb them. Um, and it turns out that uh, this is actually another huge, huge issue with these uh, poisoning attacks that sort of show that this entire idea was maybe a bit hopeless to begin with. In that these systems like Fox and Loki, they actually only really work well if every single picture that a user uploads online is perturbed. And if there's even just a small number of pictures of you online that aren't perturbed, say just 10% of your pictures, then again, the attack's performance sort of drops significantly. And the reason is just that the um, nearest neighbor matching will just find these sort of pictures of you that weren't perturbed and match you against those. And there's been some work that has suggested some more attacks to counter this. But here again, I argue that this is hopeless because the facial recognition system can just train models retroactively um, by just taking pictures of you from before, say some of these better attacks have been deployed and just training against that. And there's actually sort of an ultimate retroactive strategy here that you would have never any hope of defeating, which is to just train a facial recognition system on pictures of people that were uploaded to the web before last year, which was the first year where um, poisoning attacks against facial recognition systems were proposed. So I know that if I only scrape pictures from before 2020, um, none of these pictures were passed through Fox or Loki. And so even if much better attacks get uh, invented in the near future and people start using them, you're never going to be able to defeat this very simple um, attack. And so in a sense, there's just simply no technological solution to this problem. For someone like me who already has some of my pictures online and unperturbed, there's really nothing left to do. Companies like PimEyes or Clearview.ai have already trained facial recognition systems that can recognize me. There's sort of nothing I can do with future attacks that is gonna change this fact. Um, and so even, and even if someone um, say just started uploading pictures of them today, say a kid that just recently um, started using social media, um, again, these attacks will just not be able to stand the test of time. And so they'll have the same problems maybe in a year or two from now. And so I think the only meager hope we really have here is that these privacy invasive technologies will somehow get banned. And there's been 
some movements in this direction already, but sort of given the clear applications of this technology in law enforcement, uh, it's unlikely that they'll just stop uh, being used. Um, so maybe this is just a setting where this is something that we'll learn, have to learn to live with, that we won't be able to enjoy privacy from large scale facial recognition systems anymore in the future. So on this somewhat um, sober note, I'll conclude with some takeaways here that I think the main takeaway is that we have to be really careful um, in thinking about threat models when we're using techniques from adversarial machine learning, either as an attack or as a defense. Um, in that trying to use adversarial examples for privacy originally seemed like a, a very cool idea or sort of a nice way of, of using adversarial examples for good. Um, but there's really some subtle and important differences between the threat model that's typically assumed in the adversarial examples literature and the threat model that uh, is sort of implicit for in particular because biometric privacy does not admit an arms race, uh, a successful attack here would somehow have to work against all models in the future. And this isn't something that we know how to do. And uh, so if taking a step back, I would also claim that in this setting, uh, one, one thing that we should also be very careful about with the sort of technological approaches to protecting users, we have to be very careful with what we promise users in that I would say even, even if these attacks had somehow been successful, um, the authors of, of Fox and Loki, uh, they couldn't really know that this was true. Like they, they, they could test their systems sort of internally on sort of small scale facial recognition systems, but they could never be certain that this actually works against a tool like clearview.ai. And so telling users that it might help is sort of, it, you have to be very careful with making these statements, especially if then the New York Times comes and, uh, and writes a news article about it and you get like 500,000 people that start using your tool. Okay, so I'll conclude here and I'm very happy to take uh, questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Florian. That was a very, very interesting talk. Any, uh, very controversial, uh, but really, really interesting and necessary. Any, any question on this topic? I'm sure like there might be many, but uh, we only have like three minutes. Um, anyone from the panel? Anyone from the, the audience? Looks like we have Hani Farid who- Hey, Florian. First, oh, she, I just saw Shuti turn on her video, so I'll let her go. You're muted, Shuti. Sorry, yes. So, I have a very, like, I, I understand that there are certain uh, facial recognition softwares that don't care about privacy and are like breaching our privacy. But I'm just wondering, like, if we don't consider it as an arms race, but is it is it a way that we can bring in uh, certain facial recognition systems, large scale, like from Microsoft or from other big companies into this game to help out, like to preserve the privacy of people who don't want their uh, photographs or who don't want their facial images to be recognized by these large scale systems. Like for example, if I want to embed a certain signature in my face uh, images that can indicate to these systems that I don't want you to recognize my face, then these systems when see the, such a signature can actually erase my data from the large scale model. Like, I'm just thinking if there is a way to not consider it as an arms race, but actually bring in the systems into uh, privacy preserving. Yeah, that's a that's a very good uh, good question. I think it sort of goes towards the the second solution I suggested, which is sort of more on the on the kind of policy side. That I think um, it's it would be very cool if if uh, facial recognition providers like say Microsoft. Uh, were to provide something like this as a sort of a way of signing out of facial recognition. Um, the, the worry here is that I think today it's gotten, and it is getting so much easier to train and, and to just use large scale um, facial recognition systems that of course you could try and uh, you could just use Microsoft's internal tool for this. Uh, but I, I, I'm not sure if this is what say a company like clearview.ai does. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me that they just have some internal 
um, expertise on this, that they train their own models, in which case, uh, of course, you, you couldn't really hope to get their, um, uh, them, them to help you out in, in preserving. Yeah. Yeah, I can, like, I can imagine like similar technologies being used across various large scale facial recognition systems. So if some players can uh, come into like come to this side of privacy protection, maybe it will be helpful to understand what others are doing and develop better solutions. But yeah, that's yeah, that needs to be 